All right, a little bit of class participation now. Um, <coughs> keep you awake. G give me some examples of what you think of as systems. Give me some examples of a system. Water. Sorry? Rain, water, rivers. Rivers, okay, the river system. Yeah, okay. Others? The health system. The health system, yep. Transport. The transport system. Education system. Equatorial rainforest. rainforest. The rainforest system. Yeah, maybe that's linked with the river system then as well. Any others? Car engine. Sorry? A car engine. A car engine. There you are. So a machine is a system. So that's, that's a system. So I, maybe I'll suggest a couple of others. The legal system. The IT system. The telephone system, the digestive system, the solar system. So we have, first of all, immediately got a problem with the word system. <laughs> um, because the word system is used in lots of different shades of meaning. And it can mean a very different type of, a social system is nothing like the telephone system, is it? One is entirely understandable and predictable, well, as virtually, should be, and the other, the social system, is soft and notional. It isn't even a real thing. We've got this one word, and there, there don't seem to be any synonyms for it. Uh, English seems to be particularly short of words around what we think of as systems. Sometimes people talk about processes, um, but almost always we come back to this word system. So we've got to be very careful straight away what we mean by a system. I'm not going to really say anything more than that other than that there are what you might call material systems, hard systems that you can see and knock and plug and unplug and that kind of thing. And then there are conceptual systems which we, we say that's a system whether it is or it isn't. So that's one sort of proviso we have to have about the whole business of systems. So what would you say are some of the characteristics of a system? Sorry, a bit louder. It's interconnected. Interconnectedness, okay, yeah. So they're interconnections, yeah. What else? Structure. Structure. As something that we might call structure, and we might mean something very different by that in different contexts, but yes, yeah, structure. Inputs and outputs. Inputs, inputs and outputs very often. So the system probably has a purpose of some kind. It's, a, it's designed, well, if it's designed at all, but it achieves something. It, it has an output, which is to do with processing or transforming some inputs, yeah? Um, it has boundaries, either. Right. So it has a boundary. So boundaries are a really interesting aspect of systems. So when you have a machine, it's very clear what the boundary is, isn't it? If you've got a car engine, the boundary of the engine is the, the hard metal casing. And generally, with that kind of mechanistic system, the boundary is a point from which you look inwards. And it defines what is not the machine. Whereas in other kinds of systems, the boundary is a point of relationship with what's outside it. And where you put a boundary, so if I said to you, where's the boundary of the digestive system? Typically, where would you say the boundary of the digestive system is? And we'll say the beginning end of it. Where's the, where's the boundary of the beginning end of the digestive system? Sorry? At your mouth. At your mouth. So that is a place where you could very obviously say, let's start the digestive system. So I could then say to you, so why do you cook? And if you think about it, you think, well, I cook because I'm pre-digesting my food to make it easier for my digestive system. So the activity of cooking, you could argue, is in the boundary of the digestive system. Now, it's not, not wrong, and this is really important, it's not wrong to put the boundary here, but if you put the boundary here, then you have to think about the relationship beyond. 
But if you put the boundary out there, then you have to think about why do you go shopping? You know, what, why do you do the kind of shopping you do? And if you put the boundary there, then you have to think, well, how does growing food work? And, and you could take the digestive system right out to, you know, what seeds do we choose to plant? So none of these places are wrong, but when you're doing systems work, wherever you put that boundary, you've got to think as much about what's not in as what is in. Whereas in a mechanistic world, you're often only really thinking about what's in. We put the boundary, now we're only interested in what's in there. We're not so interested in what's out here. Whereas in systems, we're very interested in, in all of that. Any other characteristics of a system? Cause and effect. Sorry? Cause and effect. Cause and effect. So that's a bit like interdependence. We've got linked up parts. But we've got linked up parts in machines as well, so there's nothing different between the two of them there. But yes, interdependency. But in systems, sometimes there's a difference where the effect can be a long way from the cause and apparently unrelated. In a machine, you usually think you pull this lever, that goes like that, and you know what's... You can see the relationship. Cause, but in, can, in social systems, you might do something over here and get a completely unexpected result coming out over here. We can see some of that happening at the moment with changes to benefits and so on, some of the un unexpected consequences. Something you haven't mentioned, which is more than the sum of its parts. That's quite a key part of systems, that what comes out of it is more than all the bits added together. So you get what's called emergent property. So emergence is a very important part of systems. A really good example of this, and it illustrates the difference between reductionism and emergence, is salt. So when I say, how is salt made? People, well, what is, when I say, what is salt? Most people immediately reply, sodium chloride, which of course it is. But is that helpful to understanding what salt is when you think that sodium is a sort of completely, um, well, it catches fire in water or something, doesn't it? And chlorine is, you know, a, a lethal gas, but when you put these two things together, the emergent property is this salt thing, which we find unbelievable, it's vital to life and also very important for flavoring our food. So the reductionist route says, let's take salt to pieces, which is great, nothing wrong with that, because it helps us understand how to make it or how it was made. But the emergent property is it's salty. And what is, why is it that we put these two things together and we get saltiness? There are an, a number of characteristics of systems. And if you read somebody like Fritjof Capra uh, in a very interesting book called The Web of Life, which I strongly recommend, he suggests that when we get into systems thinking and the way that systems really work, especially what you might call human systems, that the metaphors of biology are actually much more useful than the metaphors of Newtonian physics. A lot of the metaphors of Newton don't work, well a lot of thermodynamics don't work in organisms because organisms, contrary to what they should do, do actually continue to exist because they exist not, they're not coming towards equilibrium like thermodynamics expects, they exist at the edge of equilibrium. In fact they're in what you might call dynamic disequilibrium. They could at any point collapse but they don't they hold themselves up so the, the organism that is me is somehow vibrating to continue to be me even though it's you know it, 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 it's what's called dissipative it, my body is constantly changing like an organization changes people come people go but the organization stays the same bits of my body are changing all the time some every day some every week some every month but my body stays the same sadly it you know replicates itself still with saggy bits under my chin and you know, puts back the wrinkles and I wish it wouldn't, you know, why doesn't it come out nice and fresh, you know, it just doesn't, so, but that's just one of the sad things, isn't it? And also, in biology, things are self-organising, they start themselves off, and once started, they keep themselves going. So if you take something like a cell, a cell is actually made up of a, a little group of sub-organisms that historically were enemies of one another, but they've learnt to get on 
in order to create something more than the sum of its parts. They're constantly changing. It has a semi-permeable membrane around it. Things flow in and out. Um, and yet, it is the key building block of organic life. So there is, in most systems, some kind of life process. So Capra is very interesting, because in the web of life, he goes through the history of science, rather as I have done. And then he says, actually, isn't the reality of the way that most systems work more like biological systems than like hard physical systems? That Newton's metaphors lead you to, into machines, whereas the metaphors of biology lead you into something much more organic and flexing and changing and interdependent and emergent so that systems exist greater than the sum of their parts. A really good example of this is, if borrowing from Gregory Bateson, who was one of the great sort of still largely unrecognized philosophers of the 20th century, says that there is no stuff, there is no st hard stuff. Everything is in a state of flux, of arriving and going. It's very much like a Buddhist idea. Um, and that many systems are based on an information of difference and an ability to learn. They, they take things in, they change. Many systems that we think of as unconscious actually have the properties of mind and he uses he uses his example is uh, the process of cutting down a tree and the relationship between the person and the axe and the tree but i actually find a bicycle more useful so just think about a bicycle here's a bicycle leaning up against the wall okay how do what's a mechanistic way of understanding a bicycle take it to bits, right? That could be a way. I'm not saying it is. But we, to understand how a bicycle works, take it to bits. So laid out on the floor, two big wheels, frame, handlebars, you know, all the bits and pieces. Utterly useless. So, okay, we assemble them all back together and we've got our bicycle again. Is a bicycle any good? No. Utterly useless. It has potential, but of itself, it is lacking something vital. Now, mostly in a mechanistic world, we say there's a machine called a bicycle and here am I, a human being. I get onto the bicycle and I ride the bicycle. The bicycle is subservient to me in some way. Now, Bateson would say, yes, that may be true, but actually what happens now is that when you get on the bicycle and engage the pedals and your hands on the handlebars, the bicycle has now got what it needed to become useful as a transport system. It has muscles. It has brain, it has eyes, it has hands. You've now got a new system that transcends both the bicycle and the human being. You've got a transport system that can now go somewhere. So the bicycle has its way of moving itself. It's not a conscious thing, but it now has the property of mind and you're giving it that ability. So what now emerges is a new whole system that can move both the bicycle and the human being to somewhere else. Of course, we think of it as this bike is taking me to a place. But actually, in Bateson's idea, the whole thing is together going there. And lo and behold, when you get there, the bicycle's here as well. Uh, it isn't just you that's arrived, you both got there. So do you get some sense of the, of the, the difference there between the mechanistic bicycle and the systemic whole? And we can look also at organizations similarly. There's a writer called Stacy who's very interesting in this and says that organizations are complex responsive processes. So they're constantly evolving, they are interdependent, they are mediated by conversation. Mostly what happens in organizations is that people talk to each other in one way or another. I'm not saying that's right or even necessarily um, better than some of the other models, but it's just an interesting way of seeing an organization as a flowing system. What I'm saying here is that systems are not somehow better than the mechanistic. 
that's to be either or. And one of the things that we'll see when we come to look at systems thinking is we want to get more into a kind of both and idea. What I'm suggesting is that mechanistic thinking is great as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. And systems thinking sort of sits around it. It transcends, but still includes it. So if you're thinking in a systems way, sometimes you'll want to be mechanistic because that serves you. When you're looking at that bicycle as the machine, the bicycle, you want to be mechanistic because you need to repair it. So that's a mechanist that's serving you. So the mechanistic serves us, but it's not the totality. There's more to the way we all work and think and be and feel and know than just the mechanistic. And we know this in ourselves, we act it already, but somehow or other, the prevailing paradigm doesn't really give us permission to give that the priority that I think it deserves. So the key points that coming out of thinking about systems are emergence, greater than the sum of its parts, interdependence, chains of cause and effect if you like, and the influence of boundary on how you then interpret what it is that you're doing. And Emergence is about what comes out rather than what happens when we take it to pieces. I'm not a physicist, so I'll probably be shot down for saying this, but I see that CERN thing underneath the Alps as the ultimate reductionist tool. I mean, it's a fantastic thing, I don't deny that. But what I'm really looking forward to is when they really work out that the universe is apparently or virtually apparently made of nothing, which is actually what the Buddhists have said all along, then we can start to ask the really interesting question, why is it that out of nothing we get the wondrous world that we live in and all the stuff around us that's going on and how amazing it all is? But it seems that we need to go this journey right, right, right down to, the, you know, to discover this for ourselves. And then... I think then, well, I think people are beginning to ask this question, which is what systems thinking does. But that seems to me a much more interesting question. Why do the characteristics of this system emerge as they do? Why do human beings have consciousness? If I start to take a human being to pieces, I take to pieces the very thing that gives rise to the consciousness. And I can't find it, you know. Psychologists are still searching. In the next section, I'm going to talk about what, what, we've just talked about what systems are and what are some of the characteristics that come out of systems. And they, I'm going to talk next about what is systems thinking? What does it mean to be a systems thinker as opposed to anything else? <laughs>